My name is Elmi Hussein, and I was born in Somalia. I grew up in the city of Mogadishu that was destroyed by the bullet of the civil war that happened in my country in the 1990s. Growing up as a young kid, I loved education. I always went to be an educated person and become influential leader for my community. Most of my life, I live in Somalia even during the war. I grew up fear for my life all the time. It was so bad that if you go to market, your family had to pray for you. Eventually, the civil war forced me to flee and immigrate to the United States. I crossed many borders because of the fear my family and I endured. I left because of lack of security and the job opportunity and I want to look for a safe place to live so I would be able to help my family. Civil war was created a very bad situation in Mogadishu. It caused people in the countryside to flee from their homes and came to the city hoping they would be able to get to Ethiopia, Sudan, or Kenya. In the city, there was a lack of education unemployment, and many people had traumatized from the war. In 2008, there was a lot of fighting, but in the early 2009, there was a situation in Somalia came back to normal. I went back to school and completed high school. After complete high school, I was planning to enroll in a private college and make a difference in my life. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. Also, one of my friends who graduated from college before civil war told me that he wanted to leave the country because he couldn't find a job in Somalia. He told me that he didn't have a bright future, so he wanted to leave the country. At that time, I was younger than my friends. I couldn't decide to leave the country. But I was thinking and feeling that I should leave. Every day, young, young teenagers left the city of Mogadish to travel other countries. They want to go to Europe, going through the desert of neighboring countries like Sudan, Ethiopia, and Libya. My friends didn't want me to leave and risk my life. I spent a long time trying to convince my parents that they, would that they wouldn't change their minds until one early morning in October of 2009, a group of army men attacked me and my family. They came in our house, beat me, and until I was unconscious, stole all the money I had saved from my job and shot me in the leg. After this happened, my parents finally agreed that living would be the best thing to do. In May 2010, I had earned more money, and my parents had sold their house, farm, to raise the rest of money. I would need to pay the smugglers. I, talked, I left them with some of the money I had saved. From there, I went to Dubai. My family and I had been scared because I, should, I thought I would have to walk through the desert of Lake Sudan. There are people in the desert that take refugee hostage for ransom or steal their organs and leave them to die. If you get past them, you're lucky. Then you, they take a boat to Europe. Often the boat sink and the people aboard all drown. When I start my journey, I was really worried about this thing. I had a good luck. The smugglers fixed my passport and put me on a plane going to Latin America. I was not expecting to come to the United States, but I thought 
it would be better than possibly having my kidney stolen or drowning in the Mediterranean Sea. As I rode the blind from Dubai to Cuba, I thought to myself, oh, no problem. I would just, for a little, I would just walk for a little way through the jungle of Colombia to Mexico, then cross the U.S. border, and all my problems will be solved. <laughs> the smuggler in Somalia had told me, once you get to Cuba, just take a plane to Latin America, and once you are there, it will be easy to get to U.S. From Cuba, I took another plane to Ecuador and threw away my, the passport the smugglers had given me. If I had been caught with it, I would have been deported back to my country. I was very excited to get to Central America because I thought I was almost to the United States. I soon realized that I still had a ways to go. <laughs> I would have to pay the smugglers to get through the Ecuador, Honduras, Panama, Colombia, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, and finally Mexico. From Ecuador to Colombia, we traveled by car. But once we were in Colombia, we started walking on foot for six days in jungle. The smuggler didn't know English, so we communicated in a sign language, and this didn't work very well. When we start walking, we didn't know we would be in the jungle for six days. So we only brought water, water and food for the first day. This was the most terrifying part of my journey. We were all afraid of getting lost in the jungle. And at one point, the smuggler turned to us and told us we were lost. The problem was that we were not really sure if we were lost Origin wants us to frighten us, so we'd be giving him more money. He was the only person leading us, and if he had left us behind, we would never have found our own way. The smuggler didn't have any map, and his cell phone battery died. If I would have walked any more days through the jungle, I would have died of starvation and thirst. We did finally make it out of the jungle, and I remember when we crossed the next border, the smuggler put us tightly in a small, small car, and we would, could hardly breathe. When the car approached the next door, next border, all of us get out and run to the other side of the border, trying not to be seen. Then they put us in another car, which was waiting to transport us and hide us in a house. I stayed in the house until evening, then we walk again until we come to the next border. I keep doing this, being passed from smuggler to smuggler, paying them from the roll of US dollar. I kept carefully hiding in my waistband so I wouldn't be robbed until I reach it, the next border between Guatemala, Guatemala and Mexico. After crossing this border, I was caught by the Mexican authority. I went to the migration facility officers, and they tell me if you want to stay, you can stay here. If you want to leave, you can leave. And then I said, I'm going, thank you. I'm going to the, I'm heading to the United States. They gave me a paper that said I had to leave the country within 30 days. I traveled from Mexico City by bus and then to U.S. border. The bus drove us off and the driver pointed pointed and say, that is American side. Then this is when I become very confused. In Africa, each country has a checkpoint you have to go through when you cross border. We thought we were lined up for the Mexican checkpoint and the American one would be the next one. I didn't realize I had actually gotten in the American line. I thought I was still in Mexico because I didn't see any sign my friend and I start arguing about if he were in Mexico or the US. <laughs> <laughs> then I saw a billboard with the California written on it. We took a deep breath because we didn't know we didn't know we had made to America. 
but we realize we're standing in the American line as undocumented immigrants. We saw the US Border Patrol agents standing and watching people in line. I got frightened again. I had no idea how to enter the United States without paper. No smuggler could help me now. But it was nothing like I thought it would be. I thought I was going to get deported back to Somalia after everything I had gone through. I told them I'm Somali, I come from Africa, I'm a refugee. From that moment I crossed the border, I was amazed how incredibly I was treated. I was provided food and my health was checked and I told and they told us told us told me to ask for asylum. I thanked them for how much they cared for me, the government. In the end I asked it asylum which was completed. What I didn't know then was that I still had a lot to go through. I was released from the detention center in downtown San Diego. I worked for two hours until I saw a Somali taxi driver <laughs> and talked to him. I asked him if he could help me and take me to Somalia cafe. The driver asked me, did you cross the border? I said to him, yes. And then he asked me if I knew anybody here. When I told him no, he took me home with him and gave me a place to sleep that night. He took me early in the morning to Somalian cafe where Somalian talk, have conversations. I didn't know anybody there. I had a phone number in my pocket for someone whom I knew had been living in the United States for 20 years. Then I thought I could ask to stay with him when I arrived. When I found him, he hung up on me. I waited in the cafe for four hours to get someone help me find a place to sleep. I jetted with the people until someone offered me a place to sleep that night. The house was full. I slept in the kitchen. I wake up in the morning and I thought, oh, good. It's almost end of the month. There should be money coming through the door for me. When I was in my country, I heard that people who are immigrated to the US or Europe get dollars from under the door every month. <laughs> and you didn't have to work if you don't want. <laughs> you American might think this is a crazy. <laughs> but everyone in Africa believed this. That money comes like it's coming out of a machine. I asked the man who gave me the place to sleep, how you get the money from under the door? <laughs> then he laughed and responded to me, my friend, this is America. <laughs> if you want to survive, you must work hard. Educate yourself and be smart or you will sleep on the street. I was surprised. I thought he was telling me a lie lie, but I finally convinced me that no money was coming under the door for me. <laughs> it was February. I had no family in the United States. I started to worry. When the month ended, my family phoned me back and asked me money. So that also doubled my worry. After three days, I went to the welfare office and told them, hey, I'm a new immigrant from Somalia. I have my paperwork. I want my money, I want my house. <laughs> I thought everything would be approved the same day. I talked to the someone in the office and she told me, if you would like to apply for housing, then I would have to go to the another office. This is one was for this time. I was also informed to go to the International Rescue Committee, which helps immigrants pay for rent, food, until they can't find a job or move to somewhere else. They did help me pay my rent for four months and help me apply for a job. After three months, I had actually began to adopt a life in the United States. I found a job at the landscape company, Brickman. I was working for six months. Brickman is a company that works on irrigation of plant, trimming trees, and cleaning gardens. After six months, I was promoted to be crew leader. That made me more motivated. 
and financially independent. In 2012, I started a city college in Ezel to improve my English skills. After I studied for a year, I noticed it. I was beginning to improve my English. I'm very delighted to be finally here in the United States, working hard for my money, <laughs> being financially independent, and able to help my family, and going to school to make even better life for myself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.